Hello, everybody, and welcome to Social Island. We have finally introduced ourselves to this wonderful day called Social Wednesday at the YSI Virtual Plenary. Now, I'm hearing from my, from my team that our guest for this next segment, Lord Skidelsky, is getting ready for an amazing show. We have, of course, prepare ourselves for something as cool as Social Island. But as we embark on, on this day, I just want to tell you we have a lot in store for you. We're going to have an amazing lineup of events. Later today, you'll see Rob Johnson with his Sailing Through the Storm music hour. Uh, you shouldn't miss that. We're going to go through the playlist that he's provided for, uh, to us dedicated to the YSI plenary, and uh, you shouldn't miss that at all. And later tonight, uh, amongst that many other things, we will have our game show, YSI Trivia. And right at the heels of that game show, you'll see the award ceremony, which will celebrate the best, coolest ships, coolest ma mascots, best ship design. You shouldn't miss that because we're going to go and celebrate each of your working group ships that have been developed. Now, and following that, I think you are actually in pretty good shape for the final thing today is the Poetry Slam open mic. That is the, that's another highlight I just want to point to you. So, as I said, welcome once again to Social Island. And I'm hearing right now that Mr. Skidelsky is, Mr. Lutz Skidelsky is with us. And I think I can go right into the segment. For this right now is, of course, Story time, John Maynard Keynes edition with Lord Robert Skidelsky. Let me quickly introduce who he is. Lord Skidelsky is an, an economist, an economic historian, and the author of the three volume award winning biography of John Maynard Keynes. He's also Professor Emeritus at the University of Warwick and a longtime mentor to the Young Scholars Initiative. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Lord Skidelsky. I also want to plug that he's also created this amazing uh, course, How and How Not to Do Economics, right with us at the Institute for New Economic Thinking. Check that out. But now, let's get to the subject matter. We want to have a quick, fun exploration about the life of John Maynard Keynes. And here it is, story time. I will now go into the first segment uh, and uh, allow actually Robert to say hi to us and go over. Robert, are you with us? Let's see you. I think I'm with you. Hello? Yes, Hello? Robert, we can hear you. You're coming through. Thank you very much for being here. Hello? Robert, welcome. Hello? <laughs> Hello, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you You're hear me? You're coming through fine, Lord Skidelsky. Thank you for being okay. with us. All Are right. you ready to do story time? Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Robert. So, uh, thank you for being with us at the YSI Virtual Plenary. We are at Social Island, and we're ready to get um, jiggy with you, if you like, about John Maynard Keynes. So, we have prepared a couple of segments, and if you will, we'll get right into it with the very first story we'd like to tell about Keynes versus the Austrians. Let's see it. Okay, do you want me to start now? I'll, I'll start my story, all right? All right. So the first topic, Keynes versus the Austrians. Um, well, um, it, was a big, it, was a, it was a big debate, and it's gone on ever since. Um, you probably know that uh, Hayek wrote a, a book um, in 1944 called The Road to serfdom. And um, in that, he said that, you know, democratic planning um, you know, was, a, was a delusion, that um, if you planned a little bit, you're going to have to end up planning a great deal. And so there's a sort of thin end of the wedge, really, a slippery slope, which leads to the full-blown communist system. And Keynes read this book coming across the Atlantic in 1944 to negotiate Bretton Woods, and he wrote Hayek a letter. And in that he said, um, that's a grand book. Um, 
Morally and philosophically, I find myself in agreement with virtually the whole of it, and not only in agreement, but in a deeply moved agreement. And that's pretty, a pretty uh, effusive endorsement. But as Keynes was uh, actually being attacked throughout the book as uh, the beginning of the slippery slope that led uh, to totalitarianism, you wonder, well, what the heck's going on? How can Keynes endorse um, this particular um, attack on him? And um, the answer is that Keynes didn't entirely endorse it. He said, morally and philosophically, I find myself in complete agreement, but, and um, there were three buts, and that um, is really the essence of the argument. And the first but is, Keynes says, well, look, if we really followed your policy um, of laissez-faire and um, allowing unemployment to grow without limit and um, all, all the social inequalities that you don't want to interfere with, he said, um, you know, um, the result would be that everyone would give, give up your policy. You are actually the road to dictatorship, Keynes says, not me. I'm the inoculation. You're the actual, you're the virus. Um, so that was the first, um, first but. Um, the second but was, Keynes says, but look, you admit that you have to do something. And Hayek did. I mean, Hayek did believe in minimum income, uh, minimum, minimum, uh, um, minimum uh, floor, um, and 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 a few things uh, in the well in the, in in the in the nature of welfare. And Keynes said, "Well, look, where do you draw the line?" And he actually writes, "You admit that it's a question of knowing where to draw the line. You agree that the line has to be drawn somewhere, and that the logical extreme isn't possible. But you give no guidance whatsoever as to where you would draw it." Um, and um, as soon as you admit that the extreme is not possible, you are on your own terms done for. You're on the slippery slope yourself. So, um, and a lot of people have said, yeah, Hayek uh, didn't, wasn't hard enough in resisting, in resisting um, the kind of pressure that Keynes was putting on him and people like Keynes. And the third but was, um, Keynes said, well, look, you're confusing the effects of planning done in a system which hasn't got any tradition of liberty with its effects in a, in, a, in a society which understands liberty. And he actually uses these words, dangerous acts are possible in a society which shares your own moral position, but would be the road to hell if, um, if they were done by someone else. In other words, it's one thing to have say, Roosevelt in charge of planning, it's another thing to have Hitler in charge of planning. They might, they might actually be doing the same things, but one doesn't lead to dictatorship and the other does. So, I mean, that was the, that was the, the big debate and it's been, it's been going on ever since. In other words, is some degree of intervention in the economy an inoculation against the slippery slope, or does it lead to it? That's that. That was the debate, and, and it's unresolved. So, for everybody who is joining, I'm now in the Zoom call with you, and we're going to continue the segment of Keynes versus the Austrians. Now, allow me just to give you a little bit of context about the characters involved, and you already mentioned one of the most important ones, Hayek. We're of course in the setting the 1920s and 30s, uh, and that that goes without saying. All of you know that. We know that Keynes, uh, Hayek, and Schumpeter all worked on the eco on economic cycles at that point, and eventually the depression hit, which uh, was a shock to uh, the economics profession, and we can talk about that in a second. But Keynes obviously was working uh, on these questions in Cambridge, Hayek was at the LSE, and Schumpeter was at Harvard. So maybe one basic question that we should ask uh, to you is, what was their relationship, um, and did they actually consider themselves rivals on these questions? Yeah, well, they eventually, I mean, they, they considered themselves as theoretical antipodes, as, as, as Hayek put it, but their personal relationships were, were, were good enough. In fact, Keynes got Hayek to Cambridge um, 
during the war when the LSE was bombed out and had to be evacuated. And they corresponded very, very, in a very friendly way on all kinds of economic topics. And in fact, during the war, uh, when Keynes produced his um, a plan to pay for the war by, you know, raising taxes to avoid inflation, um, Hayek said, we're on the same side here. And um, it's a question of when, when the situation, you know, what the situation is. So, you know, there was a lot, I mean, they were, they were the same generation, roughly speaking. They had the same kind of ethical education. They understood that, the, uh, that economics wasn't just the only thing in life. Um, and so at that level, um, they, were, they were very friendly, but they were rivals and that rivalry has continued. I mean, Hayekians hate, hate Keynes, really, and Keynesians, yeah, I think they hate Hayekians too on the whole. I think you were playing a rap, weren't you, um, just before? Um, I remember that rap, I was there, and it was uh, Keynes versus Hayek, wasn't it? Yes, indeed. So we're still in the segment. Keynes yes. versus the Austrians. And I'd like to sort of, while we're still in this in the segment on, in the Zoom call, um, maybe ask you one more question, but we'll also take one question or two from the audi um, audience who's watching here, with us here on the Zoom call. So the, the question that you've that we've just raised, what effect did the, pressure, the Depression have? Did that settle any of the scores that were um, opened up throughout the 20s before the Depression hit? But yes. while, while we're speaking, uh, you're free to sort of Put your questions into the chat and we'll get to them next. Yeah, I mean, some of the arguments go on. I mean, the other great Austrian uh, with whom uh, Keynes clashed swords was Joseph Schumpeter. Um, and they, there wasn't a direct exchange, but Schumpeter gave his, uh, Keynes's general theory a rather bad review. And, he, and what he attacked him for was um, that uh, he had no system of economic dynamics. Um, uh, Schumpeter was, you know, um, he was uh, um, the, the person who believed that the progress of capitalism depend on, depended on bouts of creative destruction. That was his great phrase. And, and Keynes said, yeah, that's actually how the system works, um, if, if it's le left to laissez-faire. But it needn't work like that um, and shouldn't work like that because it's ethically bad that you keep destroying, because what you're destroying is not only obsolete plant, but hundreds of thousands of obsolete workers when you're destroying that plant, and then you have to re-educate re them and reallocate them, and it's just socially very, very destruct destructive. And, and, and Keynes says to Schumpeter, can you really take the political risks of recurring bouts of creative destruction? Keynes wasn't against technology, but he thought it could be uh, slowed down, smoothed over time, um, and, 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 and therefore completely compatible with uh, a technological progress. I, I don't think Schumpeter ever answered that. And I think um, we, we, we face it today when we're talking about automation and, uh, and, and coronavirus is accelerating uh, the process of inf in, in information. So the, the, the virus is a, is a kind of, of create, uh, agent of creative destruction, but we don't like it. And we're very apprehensive about where it'll lead to. Um, it's, an, it's an accelerated form of creative destruction. Um, so um, that debate isn't open yet. Lord Skidelsky, are you with us still? I hope, uh, I hope he I mean, is. Do we want our progress to be... Nice. I mean, what's the hurry? I mean, I think that's, that's the... Okay, I, I finished what I, I wanted to say about that. Thank you. Tim. Thank you, Robert. We are still in the segment Austrians um, versus Keynes. Um, and the, actually our friend, and it's great to see so many friends on the call, Pablo Boritz from Argentina is dialing in. Pablo, would you like to ask a question or would you prefer me to write it out? If so, come I can on. ask it, I can ask it. I have a number of questions I really, I read three times uh, Professor Skidelsky biography of Keynes, and I have just written a paper on on Keynes that I would very much like him to to read if the possibility, if there are chances. My question at this point is one: the following. Schumpeter said that there were stuff from the general theories, like general ideas, that were already present in the economic consequences of the peace. 
in uh, in your view, what uh, which were these commonalities, or what did uh, Schumpeter see in common between the general theory and the economic consequences of the peace? Well, that's that's um, um, I mean that's a difficult one. I mean, basically, I think what um, what Keynes um, realized in the economic consequences of the peace um, was that um, progress wasn't secure. Um, that I think the 19th century had this very, very optimistic belief that things were just going to get better and better and better. And that economics was simply uh, an un un unproblematic handmaiden of progress. And here you have in uh, um, in the war, you have an eruption of a very destructive form of democracy, if you like. And also, um, you, um, uh, uh, you, you, you have, um, you, you have a big question mark over e economics, because economics really didn't take any of that into account. So you, their, their, their formation was very... Um, uh, they were jointly formed by their experiences in, 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 the, in, in, in the First World War. And of course, Schumpeter then briefly became finance minister of Austria at, at, you know, at the critical moment in the disintegration of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And so I think some of Schumpeter's views on democracy um, and socialism come out, of, come out of that experience. So I think the experiences were common. But the, the actual conditions of the two countries were very, very different. And so they drew somewhat different conclusions. Uh, Keynes thought, you know, that a, a milder method um, could achieve, uh, could restore some of the hopes of the, uh, of the, of the earlier period. And I'm not sure about Schumpeter. I mean, it's a very good question and it deserves a better answer than I've given. But um, remember, we're talking about a period of history in which all three lived and experienced the breakup of the, the old civilization. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, if I may call you so. Um, we have a pretty good rhythm here. I think the, uh, the, the questions are coming in, but let me just uh, allow the audience to, uh, everybody li listening in to know that we are covering different segments. So some of the questions you might be raising might be covered in, in, in later segments. Uh, let me just uh, um, ask one final question on the Austrians and then we'll move into three other segments before we take any open question that, that, that remains. For instance, we have, uh, and that's maybe to Doug's question, it will for sure be covered in the fourth segment. So allow us to, to get to that question later on. We're, 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 before we get to close out the Austrians, we're going to cover Keynes versus Ramsey. We're also going to enter Keynes versus uh, econometrics. And we're going to go Keynes and Bloomsbury. These are the four segments, and they're going to cover a lot of ground. So final question on the Austrians. And that is a, a more of a personal question on the rela personal relationships. And that's kind of where we want to go as well. Uh, between the, as it's a, in this rivalry, we know what the, what the questions were and the, what was at stake. But are there sort of, is there some personal anecdote that is, is telling between Keynes and Hayek or Keynes and Schumpeter that sort of speaks to the relationship that they had on the personal level? Well, um, I think there was one. There's one. One, uh, if I can remember it accurately, um, there was um, uh, a famous occasion when Hayek came to Cambridge and gave a lecture to Keynes's uh, Keynes's political economy club. Anyway, Keynes was there, and Hayek explained his theory of crises, and um, he 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 explained that the crises were due to um, inadequate saving. People weren't saving enough and, you know, there was too much credit creation by the banks and that, of course, uh, inevitably brought crisis. And Keynes's um, favorite pupil, um, Richard Kahn, got up and said, Professor Hayek, do you mean that if I went out and bought a pair of shoes, that would cause the crisis to deepen? And Hayek said, yes, it would, but it would take a very long explanation <laughs> to answer your question. In other words, Hayek, I mean, ha Khan was saying, look, 
you're telling me that if, if we increase consumption, that will deepen the slump, that the recovery, um, uh, uh, that we can recover from the slump if everyone stops spending? Is that what you're telling us? And Hayek said, yes, absolutely. But it would take too long to explain why. And Hayek never really did explain why. And on the whole, people now accept that um, what, what happens when you have a slump is that you have an increase in private sector saving, and that has to be compensated by a decrease in, in public sector saving. I mean, that, I mean, Hayek's views seem crazy, um, even, even to some of his followers, I think. Okay, that's a wrap for the first segment, Keynes versus Austrians. Thank you, Robert. Allow me to get into the main call for the broadcast to go to the second segment. One moment. Second segment of today's story time, Keynes versus Ramsey. Well, um, this is a, uh a very interesting and, 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 and little known um, so, bit of, of Keynes's, uh, Keynes's. Uh, uh, Ramsey was a very brilliant mathematical economist at Cambridge um, at the time when Keynes was already quite an established figure. In fact, he died at the age of 25 or 26. But before then, he revolutionized economics in, in, in one profoundly important way, which I'll get on to in a minute. But basically, he read a paper um, at, 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 at a, the Cambridge Moral Sciences Club in 1922, I think, which effectively demolished, as he thought, Keynes's theory of probability. So this is a, this is a bit more difficult uh, point. I mean, um, what Keynes had argued, he'd written a massive treatise on probability, and what he had argued, uh, he thought of probability as a, as a logical intuition from a given set of facts, and that meant there was scope for varying degrees of uncertainty um, uh, based on the evidence um, that was presented. But Ramsey said, he said, you, you think of probability as a logical intuition, but I do not perceive the probability relations you perceive. Yeah, so uh, it can't be, are, are we, you know, are you saying that we have different systems of logic? So what, what really, what, what um, Ramsey did was to pursue logic um, by, sorry, pursue probability by a different route. Um, he substituted a subjective theory of probability. He said, People start by attaching um, probabilities to different po different po probabilities to different possible outcomes. These might be thought of as bets, like numbers attached to racing odds. These bets uh, are subjective; they have no relationship to reality at all, necessarily. But they're brought into connection with reality um, by uh, evidence. Um, data accumulation. Full knowledge of objective probabilities is reached when you might say the starting price odds reflect the objective merits of the horses. And that's known in economics as applying Bayes' theorem. So you start with a purely subjective theory and then gradually you accumulate evidence, you accumulate data. So finally you get into, you, your theory of probability is, 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 the, is the natural theory. It is, it is the way nature arranges itself. And you, you might say, look, this is a completely obsolete, archaic debate, but it's not because Keynes was arguing the next expectations are inherently uncertain and liable to disappointment. By contrast, rational expectations theory is based on objective probabilities disclosed by evidence. The future is a statistical replica of everything that's happened to the very, this very moment. And that's the basis of today's mathematical modeling of macroeconomics, especially their modeling of uh, financial markets. In the, in the 1970s, that became the stick 
um, with which to beat Keynes in economics. So the debate is really a very, very much alive. Today, everyone talks about uncertainty. They don't know what's going to happen. And uncertainty is bad for markets. Yet the rational expectations theory tells you that there's no uncertainty in markets, that today's prices actually reflect um, accurate valuations going forward uh, in time. Um, and so, again, I think Keynes has won this, this argument. I think we, we, um, we, we theorize uncertainty in a somewhat different way. Um, from Keynes did. We talk much more of imperfect information, asymmetric information, but we don't really, um, I mean, as soon as we say that, we're up against the question, is, is imperfect information inherently imperfect? Could we actually make it perfect? Could we get enough big data, enough data to accurately forecast, say, the passage of the coronavirus through time? Is it just that we don't have enough data? Um, and could that be remedied by artificial intelligence, by algor an algorithmic based uh, knowledge? Um, so, uh, you know, I think we argue about this, and, but Keynes introduces this argument um, because before that, people weren't really worried about expectation. They didn't theorize about expectation. And he introduced expectations, and the people, the economists, have gone arguing about it ever since. So it's a very, very important debate. And this guy was a genius. He was twenty-five when he died, having really transformed, uh, you know, in, basically um, uh, uh, produced the main theorem in social in in, in social welfare um, uh, economics. So we just heard that Ramsey was a brilliant young scholar at Cambridge. Uh, he also worked on probability at the same time as, as Keynes did. And we also know that he was, uh, even at his very young age, a mentor to Wittgenstein. What was, what was going on in those relationships? Well, I think he was psychoanalyzed by Wittgenstein. Uh, no, sorry, Wittgenstein and Ramsey were both, sorry, let's get this right. Ramsey was psychoanalyzed by Freud. That's, that's the correct statement, I'm, I'm sorry. But of course, there was Wittgenstein in Vienna at the same time. Um, and um, so they, they knew each other. And um, uh, yeah, uh, Freud was very, very big. He was another part of Austria that was impinging on, on English culture at the time. And it had a huge impact, of course, on English culture, British culture and American culture. And all, the, all, the, all those people, um, were very um, were very taken by Freud, and the the influence of Freud is very very clear on in Keynes's theory, especially when we come to talk about the love of money and hoarding. I mean, you know, identifying hoarding re is retention. That's a a Freudian anal. Uh, um, characteristic. It's an anal idea in Freud, and Keynes applies it to um, the human love of gold, you see. So um, this is, this is you, you've, just got to, you've just got to consider where, in, in, what, in what period all these ideas are, are, are happening. And then you understand, start understanding the connections between culture and economics, and that economics is highly influenced, not just by its own internal development and you know, logical inconsistencies within the subject, but by what's going on in the world, which is why I've never believed that economics is the home of universal truths. The truths shift with the conditions of the time. And so you have different economics in different periods. And this is part of it. Freud influenced economics. Amazing, Robert. We will move on to the next uh, segment and that is Keynes versus econometrics. Yes, I think ec econometrics has um, really been, the, has become the, the, the gold, gold standard of, of, of modern economic, contemporary economics. Not, of course, for all the Chicago theorists by any means, but mostly, you know, in, in, in uh, bread and butter economics, we want the evidence. We have, a, we, we have a hypothesis and then we say, okay, 
let's 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 have some evidence for it. We go through econometric testing, and then in theory, like in in science, what's meant to be, the evidence um, winnows out the bad theories and and leaves the good theories standing. Um, and and Keynes really was um, extremely. He said, of course, you know, I'm not against evidence, and he but then he writes to the founder of econometrics, Jan Tinbergen, the following letter in 1938. Is it assumed that the future is a determinate function of past statistics? What place is left for expectation and the state of confidence relating to the future? What place is allowed for non-numerical factors such as inventions, politics, labor troubles, earthquakes, financial crises. One feels a suspicion that the choice of factors influencing an outcome is influenced by what statistics are available and that many vital factors are ignored because they're statistically intractable, intractable or unprocurable. Un, 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 unprocurable. And, and Keynes basically says, look, any efficient statistician can, can fit co coefficients to any, 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 any lot of statistics that are prevent, presented to him. And, um, and of course, Keynes might have added, you know, what allowance is made uh, for pandemics, um, unexpected events that suddenly disrupt all, all our linear, in, linear based models. Um, which, which is what econometrics on basically deals with. Um, so, um, and, and again, as I, and I mentioned earlier, the whole of that argument becomes even more important in our world of big data. Um, this reliance on uh, on 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 this kind of uh, information, since it promises to obliterate any remaining predictive uncertainty. If you have if you have um, enough data, um, then um, you also know what the future is going to bring and um, what what's left of human free will. Or, you see, I, I think I think there's a sort of insidious insidious connection between you know um, Keynes's uh, um, Keynes's rejection of Ramsey's view and his uh, attack on econometrics. I mean, he's, he's saying you, you're, 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 you're trying to put the future into a box and, 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 and make claims of knowledge, which are completely unjustifiable. And surely that, can be, that, that charge can be leveled against economics today. They're always very, very confident that their forecasts are going to turn out right. And, it's it's very frustrating if if you if you if you go through a series of uh, IMF forecasts, of central bank forecasts, of OECD forecasts. Take them over a period of five years, and they're all forecasting um, that there's going to be a six point five percent. You know, they're actually very precise about it. You know, uh, and and then they have to revise it, and they say, why why have we got to revise it? Because we you know. Um, Things are changing, but but of course they're always changing. What's what's pernicious is that people believe the, the statistics. They believe it. It's our only basis for glimpsing the future. And the fact that it's so precise means that the disappointment is colossal. And of course, um, markets are immensely swayed by just the latest statistic. So is there any objective basis for the, um, for the um, boom in the market, in the equity markets, since the defeat of President Trump, or since the discovery of um, a new vaccine? Uh, what's the objective basis of that? Anyway, I think this is open question. Thank you. I think the question that now came in the chat also relating to the previous segment on Ramsey might actually fit quite well into this. Maybe Gonzalo, do you want to connect the, your question from the previous segment with, with the comment on econometrics? They, they, are, they are related. Um, so just going on, on, on what you said before, so we can 
characterize, I guess, Keynes's theory of probability as as, as probability. And Ramsey would, uh, the de probability depends on the belief you have, uh, would be a way of putting it. Uh, in which case, sort of uncertainty for Keynes would be uh, lack of information. Was, is that enough? But then on the other hand, he also has animal spirits uh, as something motivated by belief that's not necessarily connected to information. How did Ramsey influence Keynes in any way? Or is this just Keynes going on his own away from his on probability. I think Ramsey influenced very much. I mean, um, I don't know whether you can hear me. You were a bit unstable. Um, uh, but I, I think I, I heard everything you said. Yeah, I think Ram, Ramsey influenced Keynes in a way that I'll point out in the last section. I'll come back to that. Um, but I don't think Keynes thought that there would ever be enough information for you to be able to predict the price of oil in 10 years time. There would never be, there would be too many intervening variables, many, many too many. And uh, the situation was much too complex. What you, could, what you could do is to say, this is more likely than that. And that is, and you can have some, uh, you can have some numeric, I mean, you can have some uh, ordinal, ordinal probabilities, you know. Um, but you can't say um, this is more likely than that. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, even the whole time you can't say this is more likely than that because sometimes you just don't know which is more likely. And then you're in, in an area of radical uncertainty. And he says that's quite a normal situation. Uh, people have now um, sort of tried to model this without very much success, but, but there have been attempts. I mean, the theory of black swans is really an attempt to model um, uh, uncertainty. Um, but um, all it does is it really it, it, it exp expands the, uh, the limits um, so that um, you, you aren't, you aren't um, confined to a narrow bell curve. Um, so, there are attempts to model un uncertainty, but they haven't been very successful because it's not mathematically modelable, mo modelable really. Um, and if economics wants to be mathematical, it has to expel uncertainty. Uh, but then is it telling us about the real world or is it just telling us about itself and its own psychological problems? This is uh, really amazing. Uh, we have one more question. Let's see if we can take it in this segment. Uh, we're back to Ramsey in the second, the second story we told. Uh, this is Asker. Asker, you want to quickly come on and uh, we get a quick comment from Robert on your question. Yeah, thank you. It's a wonderful talk to listen to. Uh, I just read some time ago a piece in the New Yorker about Ramsey where it was claimed that he published a paper about rates of savings yeah. And Keynes uh, called it, uh, I th uh, because my son is studying mathematics, I was into this. So he, I think Keynes called it some of the remarkable contribution to mathematics uh, and economics or something like that. So yeah. I wanted to hear if you could tell something about that story as well. Well, I, I want to tell, I want to, I want to um, uh, go on to that in, in my last section, seg oh, okay. because, because um, this is 1930 and this is when Rams died. Um, yeah, Keynes wasn't really, I mean, Keynes was also a very generous person and he loved Ramsey, really. I mean, he, he loved his genius and his uh, uh, buoyancy. And so he gave him, remember, this was an obituary. So you say nice things about people. Um, and, but Keynes wasn't very much in favor of mathematics and economics. None of his books had any mathematics to speak of in them. They had you know, the odd equation, which was homage to the profession, but it was all it was all in words and the thoughts. And I think Keynes believed um, very much in Marshall's view of how to use economics, which is unless you understand something in words, you don't properly understand it. So you understand something in words. And for the technical person, you put the maths in an appendix. I mean, that was that was what Marshall said you, you you appeal to the intuition 
um, of, of your reader. And then you, you know, and, and Keynes said, if I, if I don't have the same intuition as you, I, I can't persuade you by maths in any way. I mean, we've got to start with a shared intuition. Then we can do the technical stuff because that's what's required. And also being able to do the technical stuff very, very importantly is, 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 a, is, a, is a sign of professional competence. All disciplines need their badges of professional competence because otherwise they're just like ordinary people. So, so, you know, historians have it, anthropologists have it, uh, political scientists have it, they have their technical models. And if you don't understand and, and are, are not able to manipulate those models, you're not one of us. So I think all that's very important in the development of these, these, uh, the, the, these special languages. Um, but Keynes, even though he was writing the general theory for economists, he, he didn't use any maths. The only diagram in it uh, was suggested by Roy Harrod, but, but, but um, and Keynes reluctantly put it in. But I'll come back to your question about saving. <clears throat> so I think we're ready for the last segment, but let me just recap what, what, what we've traveled. We have three stories so far. We've explored Keynes versus the Austrians. That's the story we told about Keynes, Hayek, and Schumpeter and their relationship. We then went into Keynes versus Ramsey, in which we explored, as you said, um, how he engaged a tremendously brilliant young scholar, a very young person, on the on probability, and we've we've explored that, and now uh, the rise of econometrics. So we've we've we're both dealing, as you now pointed out to us, not just on the pure idea front, but the framing language and personal relationships and intuition. I think that's a beautiful segment segue into the, the final uh, the final part that we've now prepared, which is Keynes and Bloomsbury. Allow me to quickly introduce. So. For those of you who don't know, Keynes was a very special person. Uh, he lived in Bloomsbury, uh, which is a square uh, in London, and there he lived in a sort of commune, very eclectic, very um, with very with many many artists and interesting personalities. At the same time, he was a top economist at the Treasury, so he lived a sort of double life. So to just introduce the segment, I think we will get into many interesting stories here based on where you've led us already, Lord Skidelsky. Um, my question to you for this segment is, how has this double life, the, this life in the ministry and uh, this life in the commune, if you will, how has this informed the way he thought about the world? Well, the double life is quite important. I mean, uh, in, in an obvious sense, um, it, it's a life split between uh, cultural um, allegiances and, um, uh, and, 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 and improving, improving the condition of people. I mean, the cultural allegiances were quite personal. Um, he had a, a very interesting um, uh, sex life. Um, uh, Bloomsbury... Um, stood for a very progressive kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, progressive ideas of personal relations. Um, they were all highly talented. None of, he was the only economist among them. And they thought he was a rather odd person because he tended to argue often in a way they didn't really like. You know, it's like creative people and scientists don't argue the same way, really. And um, each is suspicion of each is suspicious of the other, and they and and and, and he bridged that. Um, uh, so you're right to say it, it originated in that square in 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 London, at, and it included uh, people who became very very well known in 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 many branches of the arts. Virginia Woolf was the most famous writer, but also E. M. Forster, and then there was a bunch of painters. Um, and um, uh, Leonard Wolf was more interested in politics. So, you know, they, they spanned, they spanned, and then influence of Freud. Lytton Strachey was a very important uh, person. He was Keynes's earliest link to Bloomsbury, and, and Strachey's brother wrote a biography of Freud. So 
they were all they were all into 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 that kind of thing. Well, so then what 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 this leads to in 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 the way of um, uh, Keynes's thinking in 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 explaining Keynes's thinking is that he didn't think that um, uh, economic uh, economic uh, uh, welfare was the, the 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 highest thing that people could aspire to. He thought people had to have enough, but having had enough, life was freed for other things, and. That comes out particularly in a little essay he wrote in 1930 um, called Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. And that's full of very, very quotable Keynes in that. It's also quite short, so you don't have to read the three volumes of his life to, to, to read that particular one. And he actually first um, read it to a group, a bunch of school kids. Um, uh, they were, they're quite high, high, high quality school kids, but. Uh, um, you know, it was it was a visionary piece, and he, this is one of the things he says in a, in an introduction to it. Um, the author of this essay still hopes and believes that the day is not far off when the economic problem will take the back seat where it belongs, the back seat, and that the area area of the heart and the head will be occupied or reoccupied by our real problems, the problems of life and of human relations, of creation, behavior, and religion. So that was Keynes's utopia, if you like. Um, let's get this economic problem out of the way. And let's turn to our permanent problems, which is how to live civilized lives. Um, and um, he says, I hope very soon that economics uh, will be as useful as economists will be as useful as dentists. But not, they shouldn't uh, run everything. Um, and in that essay, The Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren, Keynes saw love of money as the vice of modern civilization. But at the same time, he saw it as, a, as its salvation. See, Keynes was very he was he was very paradoxical, which makes him uh, which makes him uh, uh, a delight, but at the same time tends to confuse people unless you actually delve down into what he was saying. It's a salvation because it's a necessary stage in the solution of the economic problem. You know, he points out for thousands of years there was no technical progress at all, no economic progress, and that was before capitalism and the love of money really started to gnaw at, at the human spirit. And after that, you had this enormous, enormous upsurge of, of growth uh, and uh, technologically led growth. And that was bringing us to the, the plateau of abundance quickly. It had never been there before. And now we, 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 had, we had the chance of it. And, 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 and so he predicted in economic possibilities that in a hundred years time, this was written in 1930, so more or less coming to the time where we are, we're getting to, the time of our, his grandchildren, he never had any children, um, we would um, only have to work three hours a week, three hours a day, sorry. Yeah, three hours a day, we'd only have to work three hours a day, 15 hours a week to satisfy the old Adam in us. Adam is, of course, biblical Adam and Keynes comes out of a religious background and we'll be able to live like the lilies of the field who toil not, neither do they sow. You see, it's a return to Eden. You see, this is, you know, these, it's a return to Eden. Um, you have the, you have the original creation, the fall through, uh, human sin, then the slog through the thousands of years, and then the return to paradise. Um, <laughs> uh, Robert, I think, I think at this point, Doug's earlier question actually comes in yeah, nicely. I'm about, I'm about to actually deal with it. Now, how does Ramsey come in? Of course, that return to paradise is bliss, what Ramsey calls bliss, yes? And I mean, the, 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 um, the, the, the important contribution of Ramsey is, is really that um, uh, 
Ramsey, is, as, as you know, or perhaps some of you know, developed a kind of optimal theory of saving. How much saving do you need to get to bliss? It's, it, I mean, if you take more than one generation, I mean, it's, it's, rather, it's rather unfair to say that our generation has to save in order to enable bliss um, to uh, come to the next generation. So you get a nice little mathematical theory, which is the optimal amount of investment at any time is equal to the distance from bliss divided by the marginal utility of consumption. So you, <laughs> you, 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 you know, you, you have to have an equilibrium between the sacrifice that you make uh, in foregone consumption today um, against, against the, against the, um, uh, against the, the bliss that is to come. And, and so you get an optimal rate of saving and, and it's a very, it's very, very neat. Um, we, we, uh, but, but of course, um, what, what, um, what Keynes really is saying is we, we've got to get there as quickly as possible. And he would argue, you see, that you don't have to forego that um, much consumption as you get nearer to the point at which um, you are uh, fully satisfied, your wants are fully satisfied. So you can actually compress the period. You don't have to have, and an, you don't have to discount each generation's um, uh, wants equally. As you get richer, um, you know the marginal the marginal um, utility of extra consumption becomes less and less. So that's why he thought that what you have to have is a full investment program. He for the purposes of this argument, saving equals investment. You have a full investment program and then you can get to bliss. But of course, what does Ramsey mean by bliss? I mean, Ramsey is a straightforward, Ramsey is utilitarian. He doesn't go beyond, he doesn't go beyond saying full satisfaction of all, all, all needs, material needs. But bliss for Keynes isn't that, that's simply the material basis of bliss. <clears throat> bliss is, as he says, it's being able to live a full, full human life. That's bliss. And not having to uh, constant, not having to be a beast of burden the whole time. It was a Bloomsbury uh, ideal. That's how Bloomsbury liked to live. Virginia Woolf wrote a, book, uh, a little essay called A Room of One's Own. And she thought in the, in the economic monetary values of the time, 600 pounds a year would be enough for bliss, her kind of bliss. But um, of course, um, uh, uh, yes, yeah. so it was a Bloomsbury ideal, but it was also, also aristocratic ideal. It was, a, it was democratizing an aristocratic way of life. Because that's what aristocrats, they, they, they could choose their own time, they could choose how much to work. Of course, it was all based on um, slaves, in effect, and, 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 and people who did all the work. But as early as, as uh, the Greeks, Aristotle foresaw the day when our work would be done by mechanical slaves, mechanical slaves. And isn't that the dream of Ellen uh, Musk and people like that, that, you know, in the end, the, uh, we'd have robots who would do all the nasty work. In fact, they, they've, they've started having, um, I read only, only yesterday, I think, in, in, in a newspaper, in Japanese um, hotels, um, in order to preserve, you know, the distance rule, instead of having people serving you and cleaning your rooms, you had mechanical, you had robots coming to wake you up, give you your newspapers, press your clothes, do all the things that servants have done. So, I mean, um, this is where we are now, but we haven't got to um, uh, work, uh, work week of 15 hours. In fact, we seem to be working more and more. So I think we're, we're coming closer and closer to the end, but I think I, I'm, I can speak on behalf of everybody and looking at everybody's faces. We're really enjoying the flow of this conversation. So if you allow, we'll take it a couple of minutes longer and now really take on maybe stories or requests from, from, from various people. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the ones that fit really nicely into the flow. And again, I think um, we have 
perhaps we have a, again, let me just recap some of the things that have been mentioned in the chat. Number one was Doug was asking about the paradox that uh, potentially, you know, you spoke about the uh, divine maybe optimism that he had about the future, uh, the return to paradise. But what about the rich capturing the wealth of, of this? This was one, um, one uh, aspect that was covered. And I'm looking at the chat right now. We, we will uh, go into some of these questions now as well. Um, actually, everybody that has written now, Pablo uh, has written a nice question. Uh, I'll let you come on as well. And if your question fits into the flow of the conversation, I'll call upon you next. Pablo, let's go back to you. Yeah, uh, if, uh, regarding the, for the Bloomsbury segment, I will focus, I will not make the other question. What did Keynes accepted and incorporated from, she, uh, from Moore's uh, philosophy? And what did he reject from that philosophy? Well, yeah, um, I, I, I think what he got from uh, um, Moore's philosophy um, was the idea that um, uh, what, the, what, the, what the ends of life are. It was it was uh, the idea that uh, the pursuit of knowledge um, and uh, the pursuit of beauty of knowledge and of friendship were um, were the goals. This was Moore's ideal, and um, uh, Keynes said that he remained true to it all his life. And and what? But at the mo at that moment, it was a, it was confined only to a few. Only a few had the possibility. Cambridge. Um, Cambridge, of course. Um, I, I have to tell a little story here. When um, when when uh, Keynes was uh, had the begging bowl out to America at the end of the of, of the Second World War, and some Americans came to um, uh, um, uh, to Cambridge, and he showed them round, and they got a, a wonderful meal. And one of them said, "Well, why are we giving you all this money?" And Keynes said, "To preserve this." Uh, you see, it was that was quite a quite a telling remark. But um, Jay, you mentioned Marx and um, uh, uh, and and or rather the inequality, and I just want to say a word about that. If I, you see, Marx, Karl Marx had the same utopia as Keynes did. Actually, he said one day um, when uh, uh, alienated labour is abolished by technology, um, you know, we will have we will be exactly in the position that Keynes wanted to be. But Marx believed you had to have a revolution in order to do it. Keynes thought that love of money would do it, that capitalism would do it. And you didn't have to abolish capitalism. I think Marx um, saw more profoundly, actually, into the power relations which um, dominate uh, the capitalist system than Keynes did. I think Keynes had pretty much a blind spot about power. Uh, and in that way, I think you have to combine Keynes and Marx. Um, I've found myself increasingly um, uh, driven to just seeing the incredible increase in wealth inequality all over the world, especially in the United States. The degenerate and uh, 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 financial form of capitalism today. Um, the fact that it's not creating value um, except for a very small group of people. Um, and really plunging society back into, into you know, uh, inequality of, 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 of Roman times almost. I mean, to me, that is absolutely monstrous. Keynes didn't see it, you see. He didn't see that. Um, and that's the, that was the big barrier to his utopia. If he had explored love of money further, um, and realize that you, did, you could detach love of money from actually, you know, money wasn't the same as capital. I mean, that's the, that's the point. Um, you know, for Keynes thought of capital as goods and services for consumption, not money that just moves around. So um, I think Marx is a, a huge, a huge uh, missing. I, I could have, you know, we could have had Keynes and Marx as well as Keynes and Hayek. I, I, I'm sorry I missed that. No, Robert, we're going to, I think I can speak on behalf of everybody, we're going to have you back for another story time soon. But I think we have the final two questions that I'd like to ask 
I really enjoy uh, Andrila's question. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Do you want to ask your question? Yes, sure. Uh, so I was going through Virginia Woolf's works and Keynes, even though I have not read directly any conversation happening between them. But I have come across this very peculiar stream of consciousness that exists in both of their work. That, for example, Virginia Woolf in uh, his uh, in her book, the In the Lighthouse, she also goes on shifting between the consciousness of people. Like she goes on not focusing on one person. Also, I read that Keynes in Treaties on Probabilities talks about intersubjective beliefs. So was it like an influence of each other's work or this was just a specific excerpt that happened? Well, you know, I think Keynes was, of course, very influenced by um, his his friends. Uh, I think the 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 first influence was that he thought that artists were the cream of humanity, and economists were just a much lower level. They dealt with very mundane things. So he was very influenced by the ethos of of his friends. Whether I think it's a good, very interesting question about style. Um, we, we know pretty much that um, Keynes's style, especially in economic um, uh, consequences of the piece, was quite influenced by Lytton Strachey. Lytton Strachey was the great literary debunker of Victorian sanctimoniousness and pretentiousness. And, all, and, and, and he, he, he wrote a book called Eminent Victorians, in which all these um, statues uh, of Victorians were shown to have feet of clay. They were all flawed. They, they, you know, they were pretenses in a way. And so he just debunked them. Now Keynes did exactly that in the in the first chapter of the economic consequences of the piece. Especially he applied that technique to his description of the American president uh, Woodrow Wilson. Was he influenced in his style by Virginia Woolf. He said a couple of things about Virginia Woolf. And, well, he said one thing about Virginia Woolf, which might strike one as not very sensible, but it's worth um, uh, examining. And she said one thing about him. And um, uh, he said to Virginia Woolf, you should have stuck to nonfiction. <laughs> because she wrote wonderful essays as well. Well, he enjoyed those essays more than he enjoyed the fiction, I think. And she said to him, I very much admire your way of painting with words. And that's not in all his writings by any means. Some of them are very, very heavy, as befits an economics paper. But then there are these flashes in his, uh, for example, in his uh, memoir um, uh, to Dr. Melchior. And he wrote two memoirs, and one of them was to um, an account of his meeting with this German uh, um, guy after the First World War, very moving and 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 written with with enormous um, with enormous sensitivity. He loved words, um, and unfortunately, he was in a profession which didn't allow very much scope for the imaginative use of words. Robert, this is almost uh, too good to be true as an ending to our conversation and the stories you've been telling. Um, I want to ask one final question on behalf, maybe um, Deshvadam, can you ask your final question, which is actually a very good way to bring us back into the YSAP plenary called New Economic Questions. Would you like to come on and ask the question you posted? Of course. Um, so just like a preface, Professor Skidilty, it's such an honor to be here. I found out about INET because of your, your lectures on YouTube. It's such an honor to speak with you and see you. So yeah, my question is, well, uh, I am just like a college freshman. So my question to you, and I think this would be helpful for everyone else out here as well. What are some questions in the field of economics that intrigue you and are still unanswered and we need to focus on them? Yeah, well, I think, um, heck, that's a good question. You can divide it into short term, perhaps, and long term. Uh, my my short term um, 
interest and passion at the moment is to get us out of this crisis without too much suffering. And we've already had suffering. Um, but, you know, uh, we are going to be faced with very heavy unemployment. And if we, uh, unless we have a, a real recovery policy and, and start um, getting, getting um, uh, economies moving again, we're going to get further and further away from Keynes's time of bliss, which we look forward to. So how to, how to, um, how to um, avoid a, a prolonged slump? in the next two or three years, because, you know, everyone now, of course, believes the vaccine is going to be the magic, magic bullet, but it'll take a long time to come, come along. It, it, you know, I mean, it's overhyped. Everything is overhyped. It's natural that it should be because we live, live in hope. But so that's what I'm thinking about a lot at the moment. But I'm also writing my book on the relationship between humans and machines. And that is, is much more forward-looking. I mean, what is, what, what is a world, what does a world dominated by artificial intelligence really look like? What, what are its good points and what are its bad points? And um, have we got any control over the process of um, technical innovation or does it just run and run and force us into its own channels? Or do we, um, can we uh, click off and say, no, we, we, we want to live this way? And that um, brings one to the question of power. Um, how, do we, um, how do we make power more equal in the future, not only between you know, classical classes, but between genders and between different bits of the world, so that uh, you don't simply have um, big, big tech companies and, and the politicians who, whom they control running away with our future. Um, these are the questions that I'm interested in now. And um, yeah, I've only, I, I haven't got very much time to solve them left in my life, but uh, I, I will, uh, I will, um, uh, I'll have a go at it. Thank you, Robert. Everybody on the call, um, I thank you so much for this, Wonderful time of story uh, that we, we should be able to share. Um, we, I think, want you back for more. Uh, and there's, uh, this is a really important way of painting uh, the life, the mind, the, the legacy of a man that uh, still has something to say today and that has something to do with the way he was able to express himself through narrative, through story, through words. I think you, you made that point very, very clear. And I'm left with the, the word that you said, intuition. We have to share an intuition. And I think that speaks to where we are in YSI today. There, there is a, a shared intuition about the direction that we need to take as a, as a community, as a profession, as, as a, a global society. Um, and that, that intuition is really what can transcend some of the uncertainties that come with really the real hard facts that are really unpredictable. But with that, I would like to thank everybody on the call. Robert, thank you very much. For everybody on the live stream, I'm gonna address you now over here. Thank you for asking me. Now, if you're watching you're the live stream, thank you so much for joining. I hope you've enjoyed story time with Robert Skidelsky. I think you uh, want to see him back in a future story time edition, which we're now going to create as of right now. I've just decided, and those on the call have decided that we want him back for another story time. For everybody else, um, please come and join us from the live stream in Social Island. We're all over here engaging in various social events all, all over the day. Um, next up, the big thing that's going to be on this live feed is sailing through the storm music hour with INET president Rob Johnson. See you in about two hours.